Hey guys, um, Colleen here again. Uh, thanks for watching. Um, I appreciate the people that are watching, even if, you know, you don't make it all the way through. You know, I can ramble. Um, one thing I want to discuss about living with a chronic illness is the mental aspect. Um, it's difficult. Uh, especially when you get to a point where, like I'm at, where you can't do as much as you used to be able to. I was a highly active registered nurse, you know. Um, when I got married, I was, you know, 95 pounds and 100% muscle with almost no fat on my body. Um, unfortunately, I'm not that anymore. It's got to do with, you know, not being able to eat the right stuff because of my digestive system and all that. But we'll go into that another day. Um, mentally, though, because of the fatigue, because of... Sorry, dry mouth. Because of the inability to do as much as you used to be able to do. Even when you, you know, you try to do more so that you feel better. You get those endorphins going. Um, doesn't always work. The fatigue kicks your ass. Um, you know, people think you're lazy because you're tired. People think you're lazy because you sleep late, because you're up late, because you have insomnia. Um, you get depressed um, from, you know, chronic pain, from chronically being ill, from constant surgeries, um, from for the longest time. And this happens regularly, guys. So... Um, what happens is if you get all these illnesses, tons and tons of illnesses, and they keep compounding, and people start looking at you like you're crazy, like you're making shit up, um, start having allergic reactions and adverse reactions to everything under the sun, and they think you're making it up, you know, um... I'm allergic to Demerol, and I've got vascular EDS, so I'm not supposed to take anti-inflammatories. So, hmm, going to the ER in pain, what do I say? Oh, I'm not supposed to take anti-inflammatories. Trigger, trigger, trigger. Oh, she wants narcotics. That's not true. I don't like narcotics. I, They make me itch. They make me feel like crap. They snow me. They... I get hung over from them, you know, I don't like them, and I have to take them with Benadryl, so then the hangover is even worse, so, no, I want pain control, but I don't necessarily want narcotics, so then people are thinking you're drug-seeking, um, and people aren't believing your medical chart and your medical history and what you're telling them. Um, I had a seizure from an adverse reaction to Wellbutrin. I seized. I ended up, you know, being unconscious, wrecking my car at 6 a.m. on my way to work. Um, ended up in the ER. They did not chart that I wrecked my car. They did not chart that I went unconscious. They charted that I had anxiety. Yeah. Anxiety. Turns out, you know, I had a positive EEG that showed seizures secondary to Wellbutrin. Excuse me. 
if you guys haven't noticed before, I try to eat. I end up getting the reflux. I end up getting the belching. That's all from my small bowel not working and from my stomach not working. It just starts coming up. Eventually, I end up vomiting. Just happens. Sorry. Anyhow, um, I was misdiagnosed with manic depression because severe insomnia and OCD. I stay up cleaning all night. I, you know, doing this, da 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 You know, my head goes a million places. I literally can't clean one room at a time and bounce back and forth and back and forth. You know, and then I will do it. I will stay up for days doing it. Um, because I'm an insomniac and I just cannot sleep. Well then, I'll sleep for days and I'll be all lethargic and uh, And what does that look like? That looks like depression and mania. Um, so I was initially misdiagnosed. Turns out it's severe insomnia. Pain insomnia, which is insomnia caused from pain. Um, severe OCD. Um, and some situational anxiety secondary to f being sick. So when the sicker I get, the more anxiety I get. Um, honestly, I do have mood swings. Those mood swings I'm sleeping, how shitty I feel, how much pain I'm in, um, how frustrated I am that even sometimes my husband and my, uh, you know what, I'm going to be honest with you, initially, my husband and my kids did not believe there was anything wrong with me, they thought I was making it up, they thought I was making up the migraines, they thought I was making up the hip pain, they thought even when I had to have a spinal fusion, I was making it up. Um, when I was passing out, I was making it up. When I was so tired from narcolepsy that I couldn't move, I was making it up. All of it. I was making it up. I wanted attention. This was for my husband, my kids, and especially my in-laws. Even though I had medical documentation on all of it. I, on my MSLT, which is a test for narcolepsy, you know, four out of four tests, four out of four of the 20 minute naps showed narcolepsy. You don't get you know, you don't get more definitive than that. I had a positive EKG, which means I was positive for seizures. You know, I showed insomnia on three different sleep studies. You know, I required a spinal fusion, but I was making up my neck and my arm and my leg pain. You know, I don't think they believed me until I spent almost 100 days in the hospital in 2016. All of 2015, I was vomiting 20 times a day. But I was making that up, too. I should have been able to work. I was making it up. I wasn't sick. Lost 60 pounds, but I was making it up. You know? Frustrating. And... The thing is, is as a nurse, I can understand that their feelings that I'm making it up because I've had patients make this shit up. And the more things pile on, the more it looks like people are making it up. I mean, we went to family counseling and they just, my husband said, literally said, 
I don't believe she's got 50% of the diagnosis she says she does. And I lost it. And that was the week I found out I needed a total colectomy. Needed to have my entire colon removed and end up with an ileostomy. And the week we find this out, he says that he doesn't believe that I have 50% of the illnesses that I had documentation that I had. I begged him to read my medical chart. Begged him. I freaking got copies of it all. Begged him to fucking read it. No. So yeah. It's difficult on the patient. It's really difficult on the family. And the sad part is, is my husband, my kids, my in-laws, they're not alone. It's not an isolated case. It's not them just all being assholes. Yeah, they were being assholes. But it's not an isolated case. It happens with EDS and with chronic illnesses and invisible illnesses daily because people can't see how sick you are. People can't believe how sick you are. They think that there's got to be something going on in your head making this shit up and wanting attention. And why anybody would want that kind of attention, I don't know. I took care of patients who did want that kind of attention. You know, we, we've had our conversion disorders, we've had our eating disorders, we've had our suicidal ideations, all of it. Oh, I'm sorry, I feel like I'm going to vomit. Anyways, so I did, I wanted to get on here and, um, number one, let anybody with an invisible illness... It happens a lot with gastroparesis, too. Um, you also end up with um, caregiver burnout, which I am sorry. I took care of my mom for 10 years, in addition to taking care of and raising two kids, dogs, my one son has an IEP. He had to go to specialized tutoring twice a week um, for three years. Then we had home tutoring. Um, we did a computerized program. I made sure all their homework was done while I took care of my mother and worked three jobs and was sick and took care of my house and my bills and apparently abandoned my husband according to him. And I was tired and I was sick and I was mentally a mess. But I did not get caregiver burnout. I didn't I didn't lose my empathy. I didn't lose my sympathy. I didn't lose my ability to care for my mother. And my mother died. And I was still able. I did all of the to the to the day she died. I was the only one in the room holding her hand when she passed away because my dad couldn't be there. He just mentally could not be there. And it was obvious she didn't want him there. So I was the only one in the room when she took her last breath. And I never went through what is called caregiver burnout. And I'm sure it exists. But I'm sorry. I... I don't get 
that. I don't understand caregiver burnout. It's not something that makes sense to me. Because if you love somebody, you do what you need to do, irregardless of how it makes you feel. And I did. And I know it's not easy on my husband when I end up in the hospital and he has to, you know, and he comes and he literally ends up sleeping at the hospital with me. And I know it's not easy to bring the kids. Well, it's better now that they're driving, I guess. But, and I know it's not easy when I can't do things and he's got to pick up the slack. But isn't that what a marriage and a relationship is? So mentally, there's a lot that occurs with invisible illnesses like EDS, like gastroparesis, like autonomic nervous system dysfunction. And when you have Ehlers-Danlos Syndrome, most of the time you have many invisible illnesses. Um, and mentally it takes its toll not just on you, but it takes its toll on your entire family. I can tell you that my father right now any procedures and surgeries I have that are outpatient mostly end up I end up depending on my father because he's retired and my husband's work schedule can get quite crazy and hard to work around and um god I feel like I need to take more nausea meds And because of what we went through with my mother, it's difficult. It's difficult on me, it's difficult on him. And unfortunately, I've had some very scary events, even on my outpatient procedures, um, that we can go through another day, but to the point where there's been times where my dad just breaks down and cries in the waiting room or in the room next to me or he has to walk away or he has to leave for a while. He has to leave the facility for a while. Um, and yeah, I understand that. I get that. And I try really hard not to make him be the one to take me because... You know, even with having two sisters, my sisters failed my mother. Um, and if they watch this, they're going to disagree, but they didn't show up when they could have. Especially when she was in the hospital. And, uh, because of that my dad and I were her primary um, caregivers and caretakers and he and I went through hell and that makes everything I go through harder and the scary thing is, to me, with it being autonomic, do autosomal dominant, is that my kids watch me go through this shit, and they think in their heads, one day they're going to have to go through this too. And that fucks me up mentally more than anything. 
the fact that they are seeing what one day they might have to go through. Um, so my recommendation for anybody with an invisible illness, find yourself a counselor. And it's not easy to find a counselor. Because you're not going to click with that first counselor. You're not going to click with that second counselor. A counselor is somebody you have to mesh with. You have to mesh with them. You have to feel safe with them. You have to feel like they're... Like you could be friends with them, but still be professional. I am so sorry. Excuse me. And it takes more than one. It can take many, many, many. And it can take years to find that person that clicks. And that's the hard part. The whole hardest part about counseling is finding the person you click with. Um, but you need, if you're in my type of shoes, you know, especially when you've gotten, when you've gone from being a functional, working human being, working 40 hours a week, doing your best, paying the bills, taking care of everybody and everything, and then being disabled within a year and not being able to do those things. Being so sick you require four surgeries in a year, five admissions, and being in the hospital almost 100 days. That fucks with your brain. And if I didn't have a counselor that I meshed with, I would have had a really, I did have a really hard time. Things were not good. But things would have been much worse. So you have to find a good psychiatrist who understands and is willing to work with you and learn and you have to find a counselor that you mesh with, that you click wish, with. And you have to put the work in. And you have to understand that living with an invisible illness, especially one that has no cure, no treatment except for symptomatic. So it's a lifetime thing. That means that you're going to need that help for a lifetime. And needing that help for a lifetime can be overbearing. Overwhelming, I guess I should say. But if you find the right counselor and you click with them, they can be an asset for a lifetime. And that's very important. So it is going on 1 o'clock, guys, and I just wanted to discuss that, the importance of a good counselor that you mesh with, that is there for you and can help you, is of utmost importance. It's something that you can't. You can't go without when you're living with something like this. So, um, I'm going to say good night. Um, subscribe if you want. Share. You know, there's a lot of good advice in these. Even if you don't watch them all the way through. Um, hit like. Whatever. Um. 
So, have a great night. Like I said, subscribe, like, and share. And I'll talk to you in a, couple, in a day or two. Okay? Bye.